Welcome to the next lecture in gene regulation in eukaryotes. In this lecture, we will begin discussing the concept of translation. In part two, we ended by discussing the concept of mRNA splicing. We will now continue from this concept by talking about how mRNA is exported from the nucleus after splicing, and then we will start discussing translation. Eukaryotic RNAs are translated into proteins in the cytoplasm. Therefore, an RNA must first be exported from the nucleus into the cytoplasm in order for that mRNA to be translated into a protein. So post-transcriptional processes such as splicing, 5' capping and poly A tailing are coupled with nuclear export of the mRNA. For example, the serine arginine proteins that bind to exons during splicing also play a role in exporting this RNA from the nucleus. Serine arginine proteins are phosphorylated before introns are spliced out. Once exons have been bound to each other at the correct position, these SR proteins are dephosphorylated. Dephosphorylation of the SR proteins leads to recruitment of the RNA exporter complex, or REC. The RNA exporter complex consists of two proteins, MEX67 and MTR2. These proteins may also be known as NXF1 and NFT1 respectively. After dephosphorylation, the REC complex is recruited to SR proteins. And it's the REC complex that is involved in transporting or directing an mRNA out of the nucleus through the nuclear pore and into the cytoplasm. Five prime capping is also involved in facilitating mRNA export. The five prime cap becomes bound by a complex called the cap binding complex. The cap binding complex can recruit another complex called TREX or TREX. Recruitment of TREX to the five prime cap of an mRNA leads to recruitment of REC. As described in the previous slide, REC is involved in transporting an mRNA out of the nucleus through the nuclear pore and into the cytoplasm. When REC is recruited to the 5' cap via TREX, this leads to an mRNA exported into the cytoplasm with the 5' cap entering the cytoplasm first. The 5' cap is the ribosomal binding site and is first recognized during the process of translation. So therefore, the 5' cap entering the cytoplasm first leads to highly efficient translation, as this mRNA may already be translated the minute the 5' cap starts entering the cytoplasm. Proteins that are involved in poly -A tailing are also linked to mRNA export. We discussed the role of the cleavage and polyadenylation specificity factor in the addition of a poly -A tail. After catalyzing the formation of the poly -A tail, CPSF remains associated with the mRNA. The CPSF protein complex contains a protein called SWD2. SWD2 can be impacted by histone ubiquitination. Ubiquitination of H2B on the DNA strand that is being transcribed can promote ubiquitination of SWD2. A ubiquitinated SWD2 is linked to recruitment of REC. Therefore, modification of the DNA that's being transcribed can impact on the mRNA as well and facilitate its transport into the cytoplasm. REC recruitment promotes transportation or export of this mRNA into the cytoplasm. 
So from the previous three slides, what we've seen is that factors that are involved in 5' prime capping, mRNA splicing, and polyadenylation are also involved in mRNA transport. Therefore, this tells us that transcription and post-transcriptional processes are coupled due to the fact that proteins that are involved in post-transcriptional modification of an mRNA also promote export of this RNA into the cytoplasm. Now that we've covered the concept of mRNA export or transportation of the mRNA into the cytoplasm, we'll begin by discussing the basics of translation initiation. The 5' cap is required for two reasons. Firstly, it's required for translation, and secondly, it also plays a role in protecting an mRNA from degradation. The cap binding complex binds to the cap in the nucleus, and this cap binding complex facilitates nuclear export, as discussed in the previous slides. The cap binding complex also prevents degradation of the 5' cap by exonucleases in the cytoplasm. With regard to translation, eukaryotic mRNAs are monocystronic. Unlike prokaryotic mRNAs, which are polycystronic, eukaryotic mRNAs will only translate one protein for each RNA strand. This means that we are translating one type of protein. In prokaryotes, polycystronic RNAs contain sequence codes for multiple proteins from a single RNA transcript. Although a monocystronic RNA can be translated multiple times to produce many copies, it would only produce the same protein each time the mRNA is translated. Eukaryotic mRNAs contain a start codon. The start codon, AUG, is also called the initiator sequence and it is located hundreds of bases downstream of the 5' prime cap. However, translation is not initiated when the translation machinery encounters the first AUG. In eukaryotic mRNAs, the start codon must be localized in a consensus sequence. This sequence, as represented by the bases over here, guanine, cytosine, cytosine, and then a purine, which can be either adenine or guanine, CC houses the AUG. This sequence is also known as Kozak sequence due to the fact that Kozak was the scientist who discovered this consensus sequence in eukaryotic mRNAs. The process of translation is dependent on a host of proteins. However, the essential players in this process are amino acids, mRNAs, ribosomes, as well as transfer RNA. Since we already know what amino acids are and we've discussed mRNA in detail, we will now talk a bit about the structure of ribosomes and transfer RNA. Translation takes place in cytoplasmic organelles called ribosomes. And ribosomes consist of both RNA and proteins. Ribosomes are organelles that can float freely in the cytoplasm or they can be associated with the rough endoplasmic reticulum. The ATS ribosome is given its name based on its electrophoretic mobility. It is composed of two major subunits, the large subunit and the small subunit. In eukaryotic ribosomes, the large subunit or the 60S subunit is composed of ribosomal RNAs, which are the 28S, the 5.8S and the 5S ribosomal RNAs, and this diagram shows their relative sizes in nucleotides, as well as 49 ribosomal proteins. The small subunit, or the 40S subunit, is composed of an 18S ribosomal RNA and 33 ribosomal proteins. Prokaryotic ribosomes are similar, however, they are slightly smaller than eukaryotic ribosomes. Prokaryotic ribosomes are approximately 70S in size, and their large and small subunits are 50S and 30S, respectively.
The structure of prokaryotic ribosomes have been determined using X-ray crystallography. This diagram shows the atom structure of a ribosome obtained from the bacterium Thermus thermophilus. If we look closely at the full ribosome structure, we can see the mRNA here in this position in green. Part B of this diagram shows the small ribosomal subunit for Thermus thermophilus. On this diagram, you can see the ribosomal RNA shown in light blue or cyan and ribosome associated proteins in dark blue. The orange and red particles in this diagram represent the transfer RNAs found in the two sites on the ribosome. The large subunit shows ribosomal RNAs in gray and proteins associated with the ribosomal RNAs in purple. Transfer RNAs are also represented by the orange and the red in the diagram. So as you can see, the ribosome is a complex organelle that contains very tightly wound proteins and RNAs that act together in the process of translation. In this diagram, we'll see how eukaryotic RNAs differ from prokaryotic RNAs. In part A of the diagram, the gray regions represent conserved regions of the ribosome. So certain parts of a ribosome are conserved across all species. And the red regions show how eukaryotic ribosomes have additional proteins or an additional layer of proteins around the conserved structure of the ribosome. Part B of the diagram shows eukaryotic specific proteins in yellow and eukaryotic specific RNAs in red. So now we can see that there is a general conserved structure of a ribosome across all species and eukaryotic ribosomes are slightly larger due to the additional proteins and RNAs that are associated with eukaryotic ribosomes. Now let's discuss how ribosomes are involved in the initiation of translation. The process of translation is started when the eukaryotic initiation factor, EIF 4E, binds to the cap. EIF 4E binds to the 5' prime cap and replaces the cap binding complex. Now remember that this happens in the cytoplasm. So the cap binding complex is involved in exporting the mRNA from the nucleus to the cytoplasm and EIF 4B will bind to this cap and replace CBC in the cytoplasm. Once bound, EIF4E recruits other eukaryotic initiation factors. It can recruit EIF4G and EIF4A or EIF4B. This forms a complex at the 5' prime end of the mRNA. And combined, these three proteins make up a complex called the EIF4F complex. Once bound and assembled at the 5' prime cap, the EIF4F complex recruits the 40S ribosomal subunit. This is the small ribosomal subunit. In addition to the 40S ribosomal subunit, EIF2, as well as a transfer RNA carrying methionine or the initiated transfer RNA, are both recruited. Once the 40S ribosome is recruited to EIF4F, the ribosome, as well as its associated EIF2 and transfer RNA, start migrating across the mRNA in a 5 to 3 prime direction. Once it encounters the start codon, AUG, located within COSAC sequence, EIF2 then dissociates from the complex. The transfer RNA or the initiated transfer RNA also binds to the start codon at the same time. Once EIF2 has dissociated from the small ribosomal subunit, the large ribosomal subunit or the 60S subunit 
will then bind to the small ribosomal subunit. Other initiation factors such as EIF5, EIF5B and EIF6 also play a role in joining the large ribosomal subunit to the small ribosomal subunit and initiating translation. Now that we've looked at how translation is initiated, let's look at the structure of transfer RNAs in a little more detail. Transfer RNAs are small. They are between 74 and 95 nucleotides in length. Transfer RNAs also contain post-transcriptionally modified bases. They can contain inosinic acid instead of adenine, pseudo-uterylic acid instead of uridine, and ribothymidylic acid instead of thymine at certain positions. Transfer RNAs have a classical structure that is also known as the cloverleaf structure. This cloverleaf structure contains regions that can bind to each other within the RNA molecule and can fold up into a structure as depicted here on the right. tRNAs are especially important in translation due to the fact that they carry corresponding amino acids to the ribosome. Now, as mentioned, the anticodon is important because this sequence is complementary to a sequence on an mRNA. The initiated transfer RNA has a CAU sequence at its anticodon and binds to the initiated codon, AUG. Remember, the C will bind to the G, the A to the U, and the U to the A. And the sequence is in reverse due to the fact that it's written in the 5 to 3 prime direction. The initiated transfer RNA carries methionine. And it's this methionine residue that's usually the first amino acid in a polypeptide chain. This slide gives a brief overview on transfer RNA structure. In the video that follows this lecture, you will see how amino acids can be assembled onto the three prime end on transfer RNAs. And the role of transfer RNAs in translation will also be discussed. Please watch the video after this lecture. Thank you.